Okay, that's fine because uh, you want to like, uh, learn some of these open positions. Maybe that's fine. Yeah, they have no questions. Okay. Okay. Hey guys, thanks for coming. So we're going to get started. We can take a seat. So uh, how many of you have heard about the holiday party? How many of you know when it is? Yeah, how many of you are attending? Yeah, I expect everyone to show up for this. So we am going to be taking attendance. I'm just kidding. So if you haven't signed up, you know, please do show up. It's a holiday party, it's a networking event. Uh, so it's community driven. We are doing this in uh, coordination with several meetup groups. So it's not just the big data. So we have MySQL, PHP, Couchbase, you name it, we have it out there. So it's, it's, it's a good way to meet the community folks out there. We also have several companies coming down, you know, we're going to talk to some what different companies are doing with the uh, what kind of technologies they're using, kind of tools they're using, you should please attend and work and talk to them. Uh, other than that, uh, with that, we have tonight we have Jack, he's going to be presenting, and I'm going to let Jack do the talking. So without further ado, Jack. Thank you, Subash, and thank you for our host. I uh, really appreciate uh, the space and Subash setting us up. Um, Subhash Ranjan, I'm Jack Kudenkoff. Um, I currently uh, started a startup because you know everybody has to do a startup now and then. Um, and basically the company is Big Data Infrastructure, Big Data Infra. Um, feel free to ping me if you're looking for help on any kind of stuff that we're going to talk about, basically the whole data pipeline, um, Big Data Infrastructure, Supporting Analytics. Um, I'll give a little bit of background myself going through the slides, so I won't go through a whole lot of stuff. Uh, but basically, um, the slides are going to be extremely dense, full of information, because uh, I want to give you, and I'll post this up on SlideShare, but I want to give you the slide deck so that you can kind of look at it later on and, and kind of, uh, get a little bit more information rather than just me getting a bunch of bullet items and then you leave here and you know, I'm going to take with you. Um, so uh, I titled this uh, No ETL, um, and I completely lied to you. Uh, there's no such thing as a No ETL. I don't know if you've ever dealt with anything to do with data. Uh, but it's all the rage. Um, just kind of like NoSQL was all the rage for a while until people realized that they actually needed SQL on top of things, even like Cassandra and HBase and key value stores. Um, frankly, I think it should be called no rel rather than NoSQL. Um, that's just me. I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, but no ETL, I think there's a little bit to uh, truth to that. And I think it's really about the extract versus the transformations and reshaping the data. Uh, to some kind of structured data and then some loading, but we'll get into all that. Um, so in some regards, I do agree with the no ETL from the traditional kind of extract model, which we'll talk about. Um, but mostly what I want to talk about, because everybody has some new flavor of everything from ETL to ELT to no ETL to Lambda, uh, and I've been kind of prescribing this uh, new thing that I talked about at the Boston Developer, or the Big Data Developer Conference in, uh, in Boston. I don't are there any uh, Vertica people here that uh, are familiar with Vertica? MPP, Columnar Store, okay, fair enough. Um, then everybody else is going to be bored. Uh, no, I won't go over a whole lot of things there. But uh, So some of this comes from that talk that I did there. Um, but really what I want to talk about is parallelism uh, through the entire data ingestion pipeline, um, which we'll talk about. So uh, from streaming to doing your transformations, reshaping the data, and then loading your data, whatever your eventual uh, target score is, uh, whether it's uh, HTFS or if it's a relational database model or something in Vertica. Um, so, you know, substitute uh, whatever you like, Redshift. I don't know what you guys are using for something like that. Okay. Uh, everybody else just uh, writing into HTFS and Hadoop or something? Sorry. Apparently, it works now. Um, just so I can get a sense uh, for everybody else. Uh, Spark, people in the audience that are using Spark. I know you are, you're having problems. <laughs> um, Spark, yeah, yeah, more in development or in production, a little bit both. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, okay, so that's good. Uh, how about Kafka? Anybody using Kafka or, okay, cool, or evaluating Kafka or using Flume or Scribe? Sorry, if you want to maybe something. Okay, um, okay so let's go ahead and jump in a little bit here. Um, so, like I said, 
this fair one. I violated all the best practices in PowerPoint. So they're doing like three bullet items. I've worked at Microsoft for 15 years and I did a lot of talks. So I've been trained not to do everything that I just did here. Um, but I haven't worked at Microsoft for a while, so I'm going to do whatever I want. Um, so there's going to be a lot of information. It's pretty packed. So uh, I'll stick around and be happy to talk to everybody about it later on if you want to keep drilling down. Um, so I'll probably just take questions at the end uh, if you can because there's a lot of material here to cover. Um, so uh, try to remember what you want to ask me. Um, going backwards. There we go. Okay, quick agenda. I'll give you a little bit of background. Some I've already given you, some on myself, some on kind of how I came to um, evolve my thinking around uh, data pipelines uh, and, and how I got there, including Lambda uh, influences and stuff, uh, which we'll talk about. Um, then I'm going to give an overview of PSTL. So think. Uh, uh, streaming, transformations, and then loading, but all in parallel. So parallel streaming, transformations, loader, think Kafka, Spark, and then whatever your target sort is, whether it's Vertica or something else. Um, I'm a pretty big Vertica fan, so happy to talk to you about that, uh, versus like, say, Redshift or something. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about parallelism, Kafka, Spark, I already kind of gave this away. Uh, and then I'm going to drill down on actually some of the details. I wanted to really give kind of prescriptive guidance around uh, the whole data pipeline, the big data infrastructure, um, rather than just kind of waving a bunch of hands and saying they're streaming, et cetera, and such. So uh, I'll literally walk through uh, every bit of functionality that uh, we implemented in my uh, uh, prior capacity, where I was VP of big data at Blake Um And then some vertical performance uh, numbers that are Pretty impressive uh, using this architecture, so we'll talk about that. Um, so starting with background, kind of my background, kind of, kind of how we ended up here. Um, I've been doing this for about 29 years, so I'm old, is what I'm saying, really. Um, but uh, what I've seen, starting with the right out of college, started with the 4GL relational database management system. So clearly, I have a bias around uh, relational data, uh, but it kind of colored my thinking pretty early on. Uh, so I was MIS director of several startup companies back in the day, um, so I've been a startup thing for a while. Um, then I was a self-employed uh, consultant um, where we did things uh, like intercepting all the database calls in this fourth generation language uh, to retrieve uh, data from Btree, and then uh, honestly this seems kind of crazy, but uh, what we did was we used uh, this 4GL um, uh, language uh, to actually write data into DB2. Uh, so that you could actually write code really fast on 4GL, but store your data uh, on Big Iron. Um, so I've been kind of in the database realm for quite a while, all the way back to the Fox Pro Sybase before it was Microsoft and, and SQL Server, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, just general design patterns have always kind of fascinated me uh, as well, which we'll, we'll talk about a bit more. Uh, I was a, for a lot of things at Microsoft. I was there for like 15 years, um, where I invented this system called Shuttle. Uh, it's a, think about a, an ETL system uh, that you don't have to write code for, but it's completely extensible. All of MSN.com data, including Bing Mobile, I think, is using it now. So all kinds of uh, data flowing through that system. Uh, I think it's actually one of the longest lived products uh, next, to, uh, next to Windows and Office uh, product, actually. Um, so it's been around quite a while. Uh, but this started my thinking around distributed processing, in particular in the traditional ETL pipeline, uh, and the power of scaling. Uh, we built it off the back of uh, Microsoft uh, MSM Cube, kind of like RabbitMQ, if you use that. Um, you know, Kafka, I think, is a much better queue model, if you will. Anyway, uh, some of the people that influenced me there is, you know, back in the days of Star Schemas, Ralph Kimball, et cetera. Um, uh, and particularly this uh, person, Steve Butler, who's an, an architect there, kind of influenced my decisions uh, in architecture. Uh, then I was in Twitter for a while, kind of pre-IPO, through the IPO and post-IPO, where I was the manager of the analytics data warehouse team. Uh, basically, think of, is this getting louder, or is it just me when I hold it closer? Is it, is it too loud when I, yeah, I'm not too loud, okay, not too much. Because I can just forget. Um, so uh, in the early days, I was in the core storage team, Hadoop, Basebase, uh, Cassandra, uh, and then Blob Store, which is our uh, binary large object store for images and, and photos. Um, 
but mostly what I was really involved in was uh, Vertica, which is an MPP call under store, scales like uh, nobody's business, where we were moving a lot of stuff out, out of uh, Hadoop and instead of running pig jobs. Uh, pig was pretty big because a lot of computers were on our team. But basically all the data in and out of Vertica from, from Hadoop and HBase, et cetera, um, was uh, kind of my uh, team's responsibility. Uh, and then kind of coloring my thinking were the you know, Professor Stonebreaker uh, and such so uh, kind of colored my thinking uh, at that time. Uh, moved from, from Silicon Valley down here uh, a little bit ago, year and a half, two years ago or so, uh, where I was playing as uh, VP of Big Data, uh, which I'm going to give kind of a canonical example um, here pretty soon. Uh, people that influenced me through this process uh, were Jay Krebs. Anybody ever see Jay Krebs when he was uh, here recently? Yeah, from Tom Love that guy. Um, mostly because uh, when you build things, it needs to be operationally robust if you have to support it. <laughs> That's one thing you don't. Um, and, you know, you know, kind of the founder of, of Kafka. Um, and then Mike Lambert's uh, Spark SQL, Love Spark, Love Spark SQL. We'll talk about it, we can talk about this more. Um, and then Chris Bowden uh, was uh, one of our XRT. Uh, basically, he's just a dev demo guy. He wrote some of this stuff and you see some of the curve numbers which are pretty impressive. Okay, so basically I was on a quest uh, for many years to build a unified data pipeline with parallelism throughout, uh, from the streaming of data, uh, through the transformation, through shaping of the data, from semi-structured to structured data, uh, into relational data and all points in between. Um, so I've been thinking about this for a while, doing a lot of research, uh, a lot of companies, a lot of experience, and uh, what you're going to see is kind of the fruits of that labor and borrow some, all, or I can help you build some or all of it as well. Uh, but the main thing was it had to have the attributes of operational robustness because uh, it has to have high availability. You know, it, uh, For example, when I was at Twitter, uh, even though I was a manager, uh, I was on call two out of every four weeks. Uh, and that's a pretty big task to be on call supporting all the analytics team. Um, and so, you know, you want to build things that don't wake you up during the night and keep you up at night, um, which we did an okay job of, sort of. Um, so you want strong variability guarantees, uh, item potence, you know, clearly you want to be able to rerun jobs, you want it to uh, have things be operationally robust, um, and you want a rich development environment as well, um, which we'll talk about uh, one of the reasons why I like Spark. Uh, but of course it has to be performant in every layer and every tier. Uh, throughout your data pipeline, and that's that's pretty key. Um, so we'll talk about that. So I stole this from Wikipedia. Clearly, uh, this is the traditional ETL, as we all sort of know and loved at the, at the time it was created. Uh, I think some of the things that are kind of interesting about the ETL, uh, in particular, that have changed uh, slightly, are the extract. You know, back in the day, you had big corporations, you had data in different departments, so basically, you were extracting pulling data. I think that's what's slightly different from a say Kafka model, where you like a central repository, you know, a central uh, sort of queue, if you will, uh, where you can then pull from, from sort of a data hub. So I think that the traditional ETL kind of lives on, but maybe not so much about the extract as much as people pushing data to, to this kind of centralized uh, location, uh, which has other benefits we'll talk about. But fundamentally, um, the idea of, say, a no ETL or lack of uh, ETL, I've never been in a company where you didn't have to do something with the data. I mean, it turns out, right? They, you want to reshape it. You need to have it be relational. You need to turn an epic into a date timestamp. You need to you know, take something semi-structured and make it, you know, palatable and consumable for, by your analysts, by your data science team. So. You're going to transform your data. That's a constant in all these uh, models, whether it's Lambda, whether it's ETL, whether it's no ETL. Um, you know, the abstract could be different. There's a bunch of ways to, to, to handle that. But the transformations are going to always be there. And then, frankly, I think the loading, unless you're not going to use the data, even if you're going to put it in some kind of key value store and you're going to do scheme on read, you know, by having data lakes, et cetera, um, you know, you're going to have to put it somewhere, as it turns out. And you're going to need to to manage that data. The thing that I find kind of interesting about this off of Wikipedia 
is they say ETL supports massive parallel processing, MPP for large data volumes. Um, I know what that means, and I'll talk about what that means. Uh, I'm not sure what they meant back in the day. All the ETL systems I ever built were pretty monolithic, they weren't distributed. Uh, there is no massive parallel processing from, from when it was originally created. Maybe if you're running a Hadoop and you're moving, you know, uh, transforms and functions, you know, in a map reduced world near the data in a distributed model, okay, I could kind of buy that, right? Um, so ETL has served us pretty well uh, for quite a while, all these years. And then along came ELT, uh, which was, you know, another flavor of ETL. However, you were mostly trying to take the data in more of a semi-structured format, usually putting it into a data lake, which is all popular now. Um, and then doing your transforms once it's been loaded. And a lot of people did that. They would like load it in the SQL server in the early days, and they do the transforms in the business logic in SQL, so we did Microsoft, shockingly. Um, and then, you know, we have just transforms and, and such in the data. But basically, you're trying to get the data in there as much as you, uh, as early as you can, and, and push your uh, transformation or processing to the back end. Um, and granted, data lakes weren't all the rage back then, and, you know, semi structured data, how do you consume it, like with Hive and, and such, um, didn't exist that much. But I think the, the thing that I kind of like about this, that I kind of bolded here, is that, um, it does require sufficient processing within the data processing engine to carry out the transforms. So one thing that's common, whether it's you know pulling it from MySQL or some other structure where you probably you know store where you're not going to have to do that many transforms uh, to the data, is that consistent in ETL and, and, and no ETL and ELT is you're going to have to do transforms and load. So <coughs> makes sense. I mean, clearly. Makes too much sense. Uh, and then along came Lambda architecture. So I was at Twitter at the time. Uh, Nathan kind of came. So our uh, basically our data pipeline at Twitter uh, was uh, Scribe logs. Um, all the data went directly into Hadoop, and it was a lot of data. Um, and then from there, ran big jobs, etc., um, to consume the data from a consumption and analytics uh, perspective. Uh, but we wanted to get more and more real time, even with the volume of data. So um, we started, we built things like Storm. Have you guys heard of Storm before? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, Storm was great for what it was great for and what it was built for. Um, happy to talk a lot about it, and especially in comparison to like Spark Streaming. Um, so this top layer, the speed real time processing, I mean, Storm was built originally for uh, getting as close to the data as possible and getting analytics, uh, you know, sort of sub-second uh, response times and and uh, and um, the consumption of the data. But it was also uh, considered like how. In fact, here, let me just jump ahead. Yeah. So um, as I mentioned, Jake Krabs. Uh, so a lot of people started uh, adopting Lambda, and there's a lot of benefits to it. Mind you, you know, you're going to Hadoop, you're trying to get streaming data. <laughs> But the idea that you're trying to reconcile the two with two different you know, paths, like reconciling in the streaming model with data that's coming through a batch system, I mean, is it just me or does that sound feel weird, right? I mean, I, I, I don't know how to do that well. Uh, so I was having the same kind of questions, and thus I came up with a little different model, uh, which you'll see. Uh, but this was from Jay. It's very verbose. I, like I said, I just left it here so that you can read it later. Um, but it's good information, and I'll save you the time for corrupting the internet to find these kinds of things. Here you go. Um, but basically, it says the same thing. You know, why can't the stream processing system just be improved to handle the full pipeline instead of trying to merge it with the batch processing? Yeah. I like that idea. Uh, in fact, I liked it so much, I kind of baked it in one architecture. Um, so these question my architecture. So this is a slide, you see some slides that are kind of old that I did uh, another talk. I won't spend a lot of time on them, uh, but it does give some good context. So um, someone in the audience here as well, uh, worked at Play Tika. It's a social online gaming company. We had several uh, games, like World Series of Poker, uh, Slotomania, a bunch of other games. Um, the thing that, that I wanted to show you is this was the original architecture when I came to the company. Very traditional ETL, right? Um, you see up on the right-hand side, 
the things that I want to call out are some of the challenges that I know that we all have with processing data. So notice that you know some company, some game X, some source of data, right? It could be within the same company. Yeah. So you have users and sessions you know, for game X, you know, call it World Series of Poker or something in the case of Play Deacon, right? And you have another game. So but but notice the subtleties here that I have called out. The user ID is an integer in two of these games. Now, it's not the same integer because these companies were formed independently and they have their own data warehouse, right? So you have disparate, you have disparate data and multiple sources of truth, which is back to the whole like ETL model of I have data all over the place and now I need to make it you know, consumable. It's not, you know, it's a typical problem. Um, and then notice the, the and, and by the way, those ints, they're not shared or reconciled for the users, right? They, they, you know, when they create a user in their own system, they assign, you know, auto increment or something, you know, however they do it, snowflake something, assign the ints. And then the session IDs, this is even more fun. And by the way, this is how it was, where we were. The session IDs, uh, were, one was a UUID that was 36 characters. So basically it was a GUID with dashes in it. And then the other company had a UUID with no dashes in it. At least it was globally unique, right? Uh, and then the other one was session ID was a bar chart 255. I, I don't know how you get more unique than a than a GUID or a UUID, but apparently you just slap a MAC address and a few other things on the end, and you're guaranteed that thing is unique. But that's what one of the game studios did, or moved the name to like not embarrass people. Um, but in any event, the whole point is that at some point, if you want global data warehouse or some kind of reporting and reconciliation. You, you, you have to have some commonality, right? You have to bring this data together, and so therefore you're gonna have to have some mapping, some transforms or something. That's, that's kind of the net result is what I'm talking about here. Um, so the game applications, they would send data to us. Uh, we had the global data warehouse. They would send it in, in JSON format. It was the, the good news was it was a unified schema because all these other, you know, they had other different data formats in their own data warehouse, so you have to have some kind of commonality of some kind of common schema. So here we are, like, defining schema so that we can do mapping and transformations. You can't get away from it. Um, we happened to go through a REST API. We used Flume, so it was just this big blob of JSON data, and unfortunately it was every single event, you know, in one big blob, which is fun to kind of parse. And by fun, I mean, like, not at all fun, at all, ever, like, separate the data, which we'll talk about. Um, anyway, so we went in Flume, and then it's very typical, we had a Java ETL application, you know, with like, read these, build some mappings. Uh, sometimes it would actually pull our, our global data warehouse of source of truth, Vertica. Um, great MPP column restorer, did I mention that? I like it. Uh, but, you know, this is going to be the global source of truth for all the reconciled data. So sometimes you had mappings in here, domain tables and such, so the ETL would load those and do the mappings, right? So a typical mapping tool job. Uh, and then, you know, so, so we're basically taking a bunch of single sources of truth and trying to come up with a global source of truth. You know, so the, the common data warehouse. But the thing to kind of note here is that that thing right there is your biggest bottleneck, that ETL job application, and it's not going to scale at all. I mean, it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to scale vertically, but not horizontally at all. So that was a big problem. We we're having more and more problems. You think you have GC problems. Um, and then notice here, like the whole point of doing all of this is so somebody can consume the data. Right? <laughs> there's ingest and there's storage, but the whole point is somebody needs to consume this data in a, in, in, you know, in a palatable way. Um, so the only analytics that you could really do off of this model, which might, you know, it's self-evident obviously, and I gave you a hint, the structure, relational data in this RDBMS, is only the analyst can actually use Vertica Data Warehouse. You're like, well, so what? Uh, that's okay. It's, it is okay, but there's a lot of things that are missing this whole pipeline that's completely opaque. Like this data here, the semi-structured JSON, why can't you look at that data and why shouldn't it be available to analysts? Why can't you use that to verify whether you have bugs in your ETL to compare the data when it gets into here? Like, so you'll see kind of the, that processing and then frankly, kind of a separation of concerns as well for ingestion and consumption because this, this becomes like the single place where everything ends up, um, which is sort of good and sort of bad. Does that, does that all make sense? Sort of, yeah, okay. Um, too slow, too fast? Good, yeah, okay, cool. Because the people that are going like it's too slow, you're gonna love the next few slides though, because they're gonna be super dense. 
So I kind of already walked through this one, two, three, obviously four. Okay, so that's a general overview. Um, now we're gonna so now I'm gonna give you an overview of, of the paralyzed streaming transformation loader, as I like to call it pistol. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the same thing that we had before and then where we ended up with the architecture. Okay. So there's all your sources of truth. We already talked about that. I need to do something with that. I mean, clearly they have to send you data. Uh, clearly, your API, because you have legacy now, your API is JSON. You can never change that, but we won't have it. Um, so, what we were doing was we had a REST endpoint, load balanced, you know, REST endpoint where everybody sent JSON. Uh, you could have local Kafka uh, clusters near the game servers, as a for instance, and then read off of those or mirror those to your own where you can do your data processing. That's one option. Another option is you actually keep your REST endpoint and then those write to Kafka. So either way, you know, you can have game servers write to Kafka, your REST API can write to Kafka, and by the way, your REST API can take that JSON and write it to Kafka in Avro format. If you want some nice Avro binary serializable, you know, blah, blah, blah kind of format, but your API still stays JSON with your, 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 your uh, producers. Just something to think about. So one thing that this gave us was this kind of real-time messaging. Um, and as most people that know me, uh, I think real-time is kind of a misnomer. I mean, come on, there's nothing real-time. By the time the data shows up there, it's not real-time anymore, right? You, if you're gonna consume it, it doesn't become real-time. Okay, as real-time as you can possibly get it by putting dashboards, but if you're gonna do something with data, transform it, come on, it's gonna be like semi-real-time. But still, the good news is, by having it on the Kafka here, instead of these opaque, like, flume files and such, is that we can do stuff in real time here, like dashboards, fraud detection, you know, a bunch of things in real time, actually use the data. So it's not opaque as it's coming in anymore, even though it's JSON. In fact, we can expose this and make this available to all the game studios sending their, their data, and then we tell them they've been sending this crap that's going into the data warehouse, and they're like, no, we didn't. We didn't send you that. It's perfect in my, in my data warehouse. And we, but no, you sent us this wrong data. They, you can make this available for them to look at their data and see what they've sent you. So real value making the data available as soon as possible for, for people and, and for your sanity, right? To see, like, maybe it's a bug in the ETL. Maybe you sent us crap. I can prove it's crap. Then I'll get my first like, C word. Um, so uh, what I particularly like, uh, now this is just the overview, you know, we're gonna drill down these details, so you'll see it again. Um, only it'll be even more dense, like it would be awesome. Uh, so reading real time or near real time messages from Kafka, uh, we would write them, or we would process them in parallel with Spark. Um, Spark uh, has a pretty nice, by pretty nice, I mean I really love it, uh, ability to consume messages off of Kafka in parallel, parallel reading, parallel processing, in RDDs, which we'll talk about. I don't worry, RDDs, think of them as like just a table distributed in memory across a bunch of nodes. It's great that way. Um, it's one way to think about it. Uh, but the beauty of this is that like this scales quite a bit. Notice that we have a cluster here. We can scale this out. Cluster here for the processing and transformation of the data, processing in, in parallel. I read the messages off of Kafka, scale this out, as opposed to just the CTL system, you know, the job app, right? Seen some, seen some benefits there as well. And then, because of the benefit and some stuff that I'll show you, there's the ability to read uh, in parallel, read into, in memory, into RDDs in the Spark cluster, as well as, which I'm gonna show you, and it's really cool, I'm just gonna tell you right now, uh, to write in parallel from RDD partitions directly into Vertica, directly to the node where the data is going to land, uh, so you don't have shuffling involved, which I'll, I'll show you in the perfect one. I'm just going to blow your mind. Okay, so what are we talking about? We have parallelized reading, streaming data, transformations in parallel because they're going into partition RDDs where you can do transforms against the data in memory in this cluster to scale. And then we're going to be able to load, read and load from the data warehouse in parallel. 
And I used to work in one of the fields too. <laughs> okay, so what's the benefit now? Is that we could do analytics, I mean, if, <laughs> if all of this wasn't enough, the whole point we're doing this is so that people could consume it, right? So they can make business decisions and then, you know, they can do machine learning in the number two, and then they can build models and use that for real time, uh, you know, marketing, et cetera. They can do fraud, you can do fraud detection, you can do, you know, faster analytics out of your relational MPP store over here rather than having to run map reviews jobs and waiting for three days like we did at Twitter. And then it's like the old, you know, cobalt punch card days. It runs for three days and you get a reducer that's hung up and you have to kill the job and I'm sorry, you have to resubmit it. Like, that's no fun. You know, when you can get like, you know, reasonable, really good, like, you know, less than 10 second response times from, from, from the relational model over here. Um, and combined across all these as well as the power. So now we're getting analytics of semi-structured data, struct more structured data, non-relational data in, in, in the Hadoop cluster, and relational data. That's powerful. So now we're actually getting some real, real value in real analytics. Okay, so it's all about parallelism, right? Clearly about Kafka Spark, but what does that mean? So for everybody here that's uh, familiar with Kafka, you'll be like, yeah, whatever, I get it. It's, there's a, there are producers, they write to the Kafka cluster, the broker, and then there are consumers. But the thing you need to think about, especially when it comes to like Spark, is what does that mean and how do you define the topics and how do you define the partitions? And think about that. So this is literally just a slide you know, that, I, that I stole, right? But the thing that, to think about, and we can talk about at great length is, you know, what are the topics? It's just a, you know, a set of, uh, if you think of it in terms of, say, your target score or a bunch of tables and whatever, redshift, vertica, or something like that, you can almost even say, like, well, let's have a topic per table. It's just some logical grouping of uh, semantically related data. And it's completely up to you, the level of granularity that you, you know, want to have for the topic. And frankly, it's kind of really, Whoever's sending you the data is going to, you know, help define some of that. Like I said, at Play they're going to send you a blob of everything in one big you know, topic. Or maybe you could read it off the Kafka, split it up, and put it back on the Kafka, right? Under different topics, rate model, something to think about. Just saying. Um, so basically, you're just parsing data and then throwing it back on Kafka, and more of a normalized or more of a structured format. So as you start, uh, as you partition the data, uh, like think of partition per node in the Kafka cluster, uh, it's basically just appending these messages, in our case, JSON or Avro messages, you know, onto the end of the partitions. Um, and you can read just as I can read a beautiful sequence of messages, blah, 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 right? And so they're not, you know, specifically time, but they're time ordered. You know, whatever showed up here is just gonna be appended from all of this to new messages. So when you consume them, you're just gonna consume them that way, but don't think in terms of, you know, this message is at this time and this one's at this time. Because in partition one, and partition two, number eight, message on two and eight could be completely different times. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Because as you're consuming the data, that becomes more interesting. Or if you have to reprocess the data, that becomes something you really have to, to manage, right? Okay, so Spark RDB, it's kind of funny because when I first came here uh, to, uh, uh, Sue managed to set this up and we have the first Spark meetup. And the first question was, does anybody know what a Spark RDD is? And there are like a hundred different answers. Um, but this is it. It's an immutable partition collection of elements. You know, they have objects, whatever, rows. Uh, it's getting a lot more formalized these days. But the whole point is that that's your level of parallelism. The number of partitions that you have in your RDD is when you do processing on that data, that's your parallelism. The beauty of it is we don't have to do things like multi-threaded applications anymore. We don't have to think about, like what we think about are writing functions that are operating on the data that we're gonna operate on near the data instead of moving the data. That's the key in big data. Don't move the data. Move the process into the data. It makes sense, it's very clear, but like, let's look at that. By the way, I couldn't find a simple diagram in my head. Like, what is that? Like, what is, where does the RDD live? Like, does it on node one always, and then node two is it round robin? Like, like I couldn't. I mean, I'm a visual person. I had to actually create the slide, so feel free to encrypt it. You know, take it. Fine. I couldn't find it. So the way I visualize this, an RDD, you know, goes across all nodes in the cluster, or does it? Um, 
So let's say we had RDD1, can have partition one that lives on node one, partition two lives on node two, partition three can live on node n. It's not node three, but to be clear, it's you know somewhere in the cluster, right? Um, typically, uh, if you think about, um, you want two to four partitions for each CPU in your cluster. Okay? So in this case, we have 32 CPUs per node in our cluster. So natural partitioning for us, or ingestion, bringing the data, and then doing transfers on the data, was like 64 uh, partitions per node. Now think about that though, okay? So it's data spread across your, your Hadoop cluster, right? And if it's broken up by slices, think of them as rows if you want, or objects, or if you want to like to think about it. If you slice it up, like in this case, up to 256 different slices of data. When you're doing transforms or reshaping that data and doing execution in 256 thing operations in parallel across multiple nodes in your cluster, that's really powerful, especially when it's in memory. Uh, and that's kind of why it's kind of taken over the whole map reuse world of like typical map, write to disk, read, write, read, write, back up, shuffle, sort of, you know, right? So imagine like, you know, this gives you like kind of the, the nirvana of like distributed in memory kind of processing. Uh, but this is kind of the way I visualize it. And I just put this up here because uh, don't forget, partition one could be somewhere else and the ordering is completely different. Okay. So, I know that you guys aren't here necessarily for all the vertica, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but you should think about this. If, so how many people in here have a data warehouse? Even if you consider to do your data warehouse, that's cool. I mean, that is a data warehouse, right? It's usually folder store, yeah? Okay, uh, like Redshift or any other kind of relational store? Okay, cool. So I put this up there because people often think about I'm consuming the data in a relational data model or I have to process the data in some method, Java code, and I have to ingest the data somehow through REST endpoint or whatever. You need to think about the entire data pipeline. It's critical because your consumption of the data and whether or not it conflicts with the ingestion of the data, competing for resources, or the ingestion of the data uh, and how uh, it's gonna impact how you shape it and reformat the data is critical. So when you're building your data pipeline, you have to think about it from the moment data is coming into your system or you're extracting the data, the old ETL model, the old extract model, um, and the time that you're processing it, and the time that you write it and reshape it from a performance semantics and from like uh, restartability and high availability, et cetera. So what this is, is just, uh, I'm gonna briefly go over this because not a lot of work people here, but here's a typical table definition. The thing that's kind of interesting about this is that uh, what they typically do is they'll hash, uh, think of, you always wanna have something that uniquely identifies a row, right? Typical database, you know, one-on-one, right? Um, and you want to even distribution your data across all your nodes in your Vertica data warehouse. So typically if you're hashing on something that is unique, you'll get a good even distribution of data, right? Fair enough. But as it comes in, like in this case, you have to hash the order ID. So it comes into an initiator node, and it's, which is like say node one, okay? And it says, I'm gonna hash this, where do you belong? Well, I hash it, and you're gonna to go to node uh, uh, two. And then I hash this, and you're gonna to go to node three, node four. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you guys are in the, the MapReduce world, does this sort of look like a shuffle to you? It's a lot of data movement, right? Like I send it to one node, and now I gotta send it somewhere else, and I gotta pre-allocate memory across the entire database? That seemed crazy to me. And it, it, Twitter at the scale that we were dealing with, and it's probably one of the world's biggest data warehouses in Vertica. Uh, now I think uh, Facebook is. I think it's a pretty huge cluster as well, hundreds and hundreds of nodes. Um, this, if you're thinking in terms of where's your bottleneck in performance, that's a pretty good indicator of where your bottleneck's gonna be is in the shuffle, right? Same thing with Spark, avoiding shuffling, same thing, not reduce, reduce world, shuffling, 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 cost you. And then you start to get away from that parallel processing as well, right? Okay, so we know the Vertica hashes on these columns, uh, to know which node it goes to, and then it has partitioning as well, and it's just partition, you know, like your kind of date part and stuff that you guys do in Hive, if you do in Hive and Hadoop, right? 
the same kind of thing. You're just separating the data on disk and then into files. Okay. You guys ready for some real data slides now? So, no surprise, I have an Apache Kafka cluster. I have topics, and in our case, they're, they're, we had uh, applications, you know, World Series of Poker, et cetera, right? So, we had an app ID that you could identify if we wanted to like, run World Series of Poker. And uh, at the same time, or independently, or give them more resources than other apps that we're running. So, that's another thing you can do to kind of separate your data. You have a Spark cluster. Right? I mean, this is your Hadoop repurpose now for Spark processing, usually, right? Uh, and I'm sorry for all of you, like we did at Twitter, your data nodes or super cheap commodity, super cheap commodity, like no memory, not very good disk, uh, and now you're in Spark, and now you regret it. Um, you're getting data nodes, put a bunch of memory on it, just saying. Um, you're gonna wanna do more memory. Uh, and then Vertica, separate cluster, Whole point here is uh, you can scale this out at the top by adding more nodes to Kafka, right? You can change your retention policy, how long you want to keep the data on Kafka and reread it, reprocess it. Same thing here. And on this side, we're going to consume it. And you have a separation of concerns now, right? You have a separation of ingestion of data concern and how you can separate that from not impacting the Vertica cluster while all your analysts or Redshift or whatever you're using. Um, so that as they're consuming the data, you don't have to manage the whole, when everything was in Hadoop at Twitter, we spent all of our time trying to manage the jobs, the fair scheduler, the, you know, the ingestion was coming in, does it take priority over revenue jobs that we're running, right? So you, when you combine concerns, you're gonna have problems, right? So separating concerns, I think, is an extremely valuable thing to do. Not to say that you can't do the consumption you work here and, and such and, and look at older, colder data like you wouldn't necessarily want to do here, which is more, you know, say a year and a half of data, but tags forever. But you have the ability to turn the dials and knobs a lot better based on your usage. Does that make sense, sort of? I mean, I'll drill into it. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm literally going to walk through a piece of data that comes into this, uh, into this architecture and how it flows all the way through. Okay. Because uh, I could wave my hands and say, you know, like, okay, well, where does the show up? And how's the show up here? And then what do you do? I'm going to tell you exactly what, what we do. And then at the end of this, you guys can pick it apart. You can say, well, what, what, does that work? Or why wouldn't that work? How does that work? Um, and I'm going to do my best to defend it. Okay, so we have, uh, in our case, JSON messages coming in from all the apps, users, sessions, you know, a bunch of other stuff, game, event, data, but whatever, just keep it simple, right? So it's coming in your Kafka cluster, the writing, the pending to each topic, right, and then each partition. Okay, what we do is we start up a Spark driver app, a Spark driver per application, which is a nice thing to do because then we can shut down WSOP if there's, you know, all their data is bad, why process it, or whatever. We can, you know, uh, give uh, precedence to their uh, to their jobs as far as resources in the cluster, which is our model. Sorry, a little build slide problem here. Um, so the second thing that we do is this is the global source of truth for, for, the, for the data in Playtica. So this is where all the users come together and where they have like a unique identifier assigned to each one across all applications. Okay. Clearly there's going to be a mapping, right? Because remember they have their own user IDs, their own you know session IDs, and they're like a crazy good. But like, do you want to join on what was that thing, a bar chart 255 or something? Do you want to like have that in all your session tables, and then have the other one that's a UUID and then a GUID ID. I mean, this is crazy, I mean, to, to think about writing queries that join those. So I'll explain what we did in that case. The point that I kind of want to bring about here is that I guarantee you you have mapping tables. I guarantee you that you have domain tables and lookup. I guarantee you that you're going to want to reconcile heterogeneous data, bar none, unless you're not really processing data. Um, so, source of truth is here, but what we do on startup is we, we load that into Spark. Okay? So, we load all the existing users and the mapping between the natural key and the, and the surrogate key, like in our case an, an integer, to have that mapping across all applications. Because we can do that distributed in memory and we get 
parallelization when we do the processing and joining to that memory with the Spark SQL or whatever you want to use for that processing. So long-term permanent score is here, but when we do the processing, we can load it here temporarily. Again, separation of sort of concerns and be able to have the best of both worlds, okay? Uh, sessions, we, we, we do map sessions, we did map, we do, I don't work there anymore. Uh, I was started that. Um, we did map sessions uh, as well, but you don't need to keep those forever, it's clearly like, you're just keeping a, a session, so some, some, some web log events as well, right? You're only gonna keep, uh, you're only gonna keep a certain amount to, to find out if it maps to the user. Right? Like the sessions are gonna, you know, over the next 48 hours or even a few days, if the data is trickling in slowly, right, the, the user that's associated with that session, you're only gonna need to keep like a certain amount of sessions. But you do wanna know for this user, for this session, you know, what game events they had or whatever, right? Very typical kind of, you know, web logs. Okay, so now comes the really cool stuff and why I built this slide so you can look at it later and go, oh, that was genius, or I still don't get it, I don't know. Um, so what we did, I'm going to talk to this a little, a little bit more, is um, we use MySQL, uh, and so imagine that you have a table called the Kafka table, okay? And in our case, for every application, we had an app ID, and then what we did was we stored the offset range, uh, so think topic, uh, partition, and the offsets that you're processing at the time you're reading the data, okay? And then what we do is, while we're processing that chunk of data, you can do it in a streaming world, but I tend to, which I'll get to, tend to think in terms of more um, near real time uh, processing of data as quick as you can off the Kafka uh, cluster. Uh, and then eventually, if you're gonna write that data somewhere, and you have to reprocess it, how do you reprocess it if you haven't designed like some batch of work? So what we did was we said for this topic, for this this partition, for the offsets that we process, we assigned a batch ID, just an integer, and that gets stamped to the record that gets written into the data warehouse. Now, if you have to reprocess it, which I'll talk about, you just delete everything related to that 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 batch ID that you assigned, and you just start the process back from reading from you just reset that uh, the table to say reprocess from where where I should be, and it's just going to go back in time. I'll, I'll explain that a little bit better. Um, and then we have like a maximum, uh, we call it a get a global identifier, a maximum session and a maximum user, because as new users coming in, you're gonna assign a new new ID, right? Just gonna auto increment. But that gets interesting when you have like multiple sources of truth. Like how do I, you start to think of like Snowflake, and how do I you know, manage multiple uh, contention of like uh, assigning user IDs when multiple apps are running, and I'll, I'll explain that. Okay, so, is that kind of making sense so far? Too fast, not too fast. So okay, no, it's not making sense. Okay, <laughs> too late. I don't know. Uh, so <laughs> the fourth step in the process is that um, Spark uh, is reading from Kafka. Uh, as you might have guessed, in our case, it's sort of a non-streaming because it's starting from the last set of topics and partitions and offsets that it read before and reading forward. Now. It can read all the way to end the file on Kafka, so it's it's going to get you know real time data, but eventually you're going to have to do some processing with it. Sorry, you are you want to use the data, and then when you go back to Kafka, it's no longer real time, right? I mean, you can try to do it as fast as you want, so that's why I kind of put in you know the optional parameters here, uh, non streaming. I think that's what usually people are going to start to come around to. Unless you're doing like a dashboard or something, you want to see it fairly new, real time kind of thing. But if you're going to do some transformations or reshape it and write it to another store, there's latency. There just is. Um, so, okay. So in our case, uh, we're reading messages. The key is that we're reading messages. See why there's multiple arrows coming in from Kafka? We're reading messages using Spark in parallel. So your level of parallelism on reading messages in Spark are the RDDs, or is the uh, topic partition. So the level of, of parallelism reading Kafka uh, are, your, are, are your Kafka partitions, okay? More partitions, more parallelism for reading, right? But you gotta be careful, you don't want too many of those things, because they're actually like files on disk and stuff. Um, 
So what we did was uh, we read uh, into an RDD uh, the game events, users, sessions, etc. across n partitions. Remember this picture I had before? We have it partitioned across all you know uh, across the the um, cluster. Keeping in mind that as you're reading it, um, it's going to be the level of parallelism that you're reading, and then level and the RDD partitions that you're creating are going to be like a one to one with how you define in, in Kafka. Okay? Um, why is that important? Um, so in our case, what we had to do, and I suspect everybody has to do something like this at some point, is that the data that's coming in, we might have seen this user before, right? We might have seen the session before, we might have written it to the data warehouse, that's why we created the mapping. Uh, so basically we've assigned a unique identifier to the, to the sessions and to the users in some cases in the incoming data, right? In some cases, not. So where we've already assigned them, uh, we can create a different RDD with the users that have IDs assigned already, right? And maybe we should take the opportunity to reshape the data at that point as long as we're gonna read it and put it into a different RDD, you know, do a little parsing, you know, changing the, an epic to a nice timestamp or something as we're gonna do some execution with it, create another RDD. Same thing with sessions, and then now, what we can do is we can say, um, now we can, sorry, I jumped ahead. But uh, now what we can do is say, all those that don't have a unique identifier assigned across all the different applications, we need to assign one, okay? Uh, and this is kind of cool. So <clears throat> one thing that you can do is when you create the RDDs in Spark and the partitions, um, and in our case, they'll be all the ones that we need to assign IDs to. So we can say, how many partitions are there? You know, map partition, map partition with index, right? And you can get the size. So this partition has 100 records in it. This partition two has 1,000 records in it. Partition three has, you know, so many records. I know the number of records that I need to assign an ID to by just getting the size of the partitions. Okay. And you see the brilliance here. So then what we do is we say, I have 10,000 IDs that I need to assign to the set of data that I have to have a common, you know, uh, surrogate key for the, for the natural key coming in, right? So what do I do? So now I just go to this table that's in my SQL and I say select for update, which is going to hold a lock, so a brief lock on that table to so say what's the last integer value on that table, the last user that I assign plus 10,000 that I need to assign. Boom, quick write, no big contention, no hard snowflake problem for like adding these. Now all I can do, now all I have to do is go through each RDD and actually assign, you know, this, this, this ID to another RDD, you know, a unique identifier to every single row. So now I have an RDD to all the one, the users in the sessions that already have IDs assigned globally, and I have another set of RDDs and predictions that were assigned now, all I have to do is do a SQL union between the two, and I have my full set of data that I need to insert with globally unique identifiers for all of them. And every app that comes in can come in independently of this, and hardly any contention at all, and this actually uh, scales extremely well, by the way. You can read about the slug for update. Okay, so I have in memory now, my full set of RDDs with all my serial keys, some transforming that I want to do, now we need to load it, right? Because you got to load it here. All this has been done in, in, uh, in memory. So one of the things that really bothered me, I guess, is uh, we could load tremendous amounts of data in Vertica, um, but not nearly as much as we wanted to with the volume of data that we had at Twitter. And it just kind of always bothered me. You can load data pretty fast in Vertica or other stores, Redshift and stuff. Um, but what kind of bothered me was, remember that slide where the data that was coming in and said, I need to hash this and it goes to this node, this node, this node? I'm like, well, that's crazy. I already have the actual row. I have the ID that I want to hash on. I have it in memory. Uh, why do I have to shuffle around? So I convinced Vertica to give us their hashing algorithm. And so, and then we do the hashing algorithm in parallel in that memory RDDs. So now I know exactly which node it goes to. So guess what? I partition matching the exact nodes in my cluster in Vertica, bucketing just a group by, right? By this hash that gives me the even distribution. But the real benefit 
is that if, you, if you're used to using something like, I mean, everything has, if you're a SQL server, BCP, right? Uh, if you use Vertica, it's a copy command. I mean, every, everybody has a bulk copy insert command, right? Um, typically, you know, maybe you pipe it to standard in, or it reads it from file in some delimited format and bulk copies it in your, your data warehouse, right? Uh, Vertica is no different. Uh, what we did was we wrote our own uh, uh, user-defined library source, and what it is uh, actually is a TCP server, a little stub, runs on all the nodes in Vertica, and it sits there and listens on a port. It's just like a UDF. Uh, sits there and listens on the port, and then you can stream data, and guess what? We already have the buckets. Everything in this partition I know is going to node one. It's just sitting there listening on the port, we literally open a port, stream the data directly from memory, and it writes it directly to that Vertica node with no data movement, all in parallel. Parallel ingestion from Kafka, parallelization and performing transformations, and then reshaping the data with parallel loading. I have an animation. There we go. Um, so we just pour each over the partitions, and we just open a socket, and just stream the data directly to the node, and Vertica goes, oh yeah, you belong here. No need to move it, okay? So, parallelization to the streaming transformation loader. Okay, now, we're not quite done yet, though, by the way. So now, what do we want to do? We have data in our data warehouse. It's nice and structured. It's been reshaped. It's, like, relational. It has keys assigned. It's been loaded in parallel. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, but we still have this memory still, and uh, this data in memory. Uh, let's not lose that, because you might want to just keep this nice structured data around for maybe a year and a half, but we'll build aggregate tables that analysts are using to keep those forever, right? But we don't want, like, the, the raw data there forever, in part because there's nobody from Vertica here. Is there? They charge you for storage and licensing, so now you want to kind of manage that, maybe. Change your retention policy there. Um, cheaper commodity hardware up here, just sort of saying. Um, so what you can do though is you can then write that raw JSON data into HDFS, right, or S3 or whatever you want to write that. Uh, you've already reshaped your data to target the tables that you're going to write to in your in your data warehouse, right, in your in your long-term store. Because you you have to match like this is the customer and it has these fields and whatever, right? You're going to write that. So you already have in memory your RDD that looks and smells exactly like the tables in your data warehouse, right? It's been re it, you've reshaped it, you've transformed it, you've cleansed it, you've done stuff with it. So save it. Save it in addition. Save it in a work file, parquet file format, snappy compressed. Now the benefit there is you can write SQL off your structured query and stuff like that, your consumption to manage, you know, uh, scale, etc. here. But if you change the retention policy here and you want to read the data that's really old, because you might later on go, you know, we need to look at that old data. Now I can use Spark SQL or Hive or Impala to read that data that looks exactly like a nice structured format. It's not just a, a messy data lake of unstructured data, because I already had it. Just flush it to disk. So now I have the unstructured data that I could do stuff with as well. I have the structured data, and if I want to do some stuff and read this data here and match it to Kafka, I can do that. And at this. Vertica has a way now to do vSQL, which is basically I can read data in SQL here, and I can have external tables here in ORC file format, think Parquet file format, columnar store, right? And do heterogeneous joins between the two. Oh my god. I mean, it used to be you had Impala or you had, you know, Pig or you had Hive, and you're stuck here. Like you couldn't, you know, you couldn't marry this, the two data sets between the two. Now you can, so by the way, it's really fast. Faster than Paul, I'm just saying. Um, so you can have the external tables here as well. Uh, Vertica also has, uh, just came out, just give me a quick little plug. Um, they have a Kafka connector, so you can read uh, topics off of Kafka in a scheduled manner and write them directly to Vertica. I think that's pretty powerful, but I think clearly you're always going to reshape the data and reformat the data, so you're going to have to do something with it. Right? And then maybe that goes back to the model I mentioned, like maybe you're going to read Kafka, reshape it, throw it back on this topic, and then it just writes it into Vertica. It does it in parallel by topics directly into Vertica. It's all about parallelism. When we uh, created this method, we created this method and wrote this, 
we were working closely with the Vertica devs, uh, and then as they were doing the Kafka connector, we shared notes. Uh, Vertica also has a Spark connector now, um, which I can talk about if you want to talk about it offline if you use Vertica. Uh, good and bad uh, in the beta program. Uh, the good news is you can read uh, you can read out in parallel directly to Spark RDD, and it'll read it directly from the nodes. They use the same kind of technique that we did, just read the data from the nodes, load it into parallel into your Spark RDDs, uh, and then do some processing. The processing from Spark RDDs into Vertica doesn't perform all that well. Sorry. Okay, so I just wanted to kind of show you, kind of give it away. So we did some benchmarking, some testing of this methodology of loading into Vertica. Uh, just on an eight node cluster, 451 gigabyte uh, data set, we were able to load it into Vertica. That means reading it off of a, a set of eight nodes and copying it across the network and then writing it into Vertica in seven and a half minutes, 2.42 billion rows. So usually this is when people applaud and just saying you don't have to applaud. So Facebook uh, actually showed uh, last year, kind of stole the show at the big data conference. They loaded 35 terabytes an hour. I mean, come on, that's huge, right? They loaded 35 terabytes an hour of data, uh, working with uh, Twitter, or sorry, working with uh, Vertica. But it took them 270 nodes to load that much data into Vertica, okay? And 45 of the, or uh, 215 of those nodes were storing data, but the rest of the nodes, do the math, 270 minus uh, 15 is what? 55. 55. 55. Sort of around there. 55 nodes were dedicated to just doing the shuffling. Okay? In our model, parallel loading, they're all storing and they, there's no shuffling. Okay. So we could do it in 81 nodes versus 270 nodes. That's real money at the end of the day. That's pretty fast. So key takeaways are parallelism with Kafka reads to spark RDBs in memory. And writes to Vertica in parallel through TCP server. It just rocks. We can load 36 terabytes an hour with only 81 nodes, and we can do that even faster. We don't even have to have ephemeral nodes assigned uh, to just sit in there idly. Uh, it gives us uh, parallelism off the Kafka reads directly into uh, RDD partitions. We do the a priori hashing, like I mentioned, uh, and the single copy command uh, doesn't consume memory across all nodes, uh, where uh, other methods uh, require memory across all nodes. So very low memory footprint. All 32 CPUs, just keep me busy. Thank you. Happy, happy to field questions, um, and I'll stick around for a while as well. If you want to ask me something really hard, and, yeah. Just out of curiosity, um, you were talking about session data a little bit earlier, and I wondered if you had tried or thought about trying exposing session identifiers and session data as um, Spark broadcast variables. Does that make any sense to handle distribution of sessions across your, your Spark cluster? Yeah, so the question was um, where you have, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, where you have a commonality like uh, we're signing a unique identifier uh, uh, that needs to be available across distributed data sets in RDDs, uh, did you ever think about broadcast variables? And the answer to that is yes. Anybody else? No. And so, so the, yes, we did. Uh, broadcast variables, we do use them for certain things like uh, sort of caching connections and a few other things. Um, it's not really a good model because it goes back up to the driver. So anything going back to the driver, we were talking about this earlier, uh, you want to have your executors, the things that are running on all your nodes, uh, you know, processing your, the, uh, the data itself. Uh, you want all of your processing there and coming back to the driver, aside from like a final result set or something, sort of a final shuffle or a goodbye kind of thing, um, you don't want to do a lot of state. Like you want to think stateless, 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 and broadcast variables are kind of nice for some commonality. We used it, I think maybe this is where you're going, we used it sometimes for the, for the auto-incrementing type of stuff, where they could go back and then the, the drivers could say, you know, oh, what is the current, you know, I, the, last auto increment ID so I don't have to read from the database or something. So you can do it for things like that. I was, I was thinking mostly specifically about session data because you know it seems like it might be a good mechanism for having user data spread through the cluster for real time machine and for purposes. I don't know if that's a good 
Um, we had a lot of sessions. So. <laughs> 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 we didn't, yeah, we, I mean, like lots. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to serialize in some way. Yeah. But yeah. It's a good question, though. Really good question. Yeah. Anything you say about size of RDDs or yeah, so the question was uh, size of RDDs. Um, so uh, there's some good and new, uh, good and bad uh, things to consider there. Um, you know, how, how, how big are your objects? You know, how much are you trying to keep in memory? Uh, that factors into it. Uh, the general processing rule, like I said, is, you know, uh, two-ish RDDs per CPU is good for processing, uh, but they're, you know, when you have a lot of data and, and memory spread across your cluster, it's something to consider. Um, now, one thing that in our case, and this does come to the size of RDDs, is uh, we want to bucket, typically you want to bucket your data at some point in time for like consuming, or in our case, affinity to the vertical nodes. So we did have to reduce the number of RDDs down. So there is a, a reshuffling now from in memory to another set of memory. So, I mean, there's no perfect formula. It kind of depends on your use cases and stuff. Um, there's some stuff that you can do to kind of do a little bit of math around that. Um, it's not a great answer for you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, one thing I want to stick around so you want to keep asking questions. Uh, just quickly, I want to thank uh, George and Team World for hosting tonight's event. So, a round of applause for them, please. So, oh, I quickly want to mention if you park outside, uh, so if you parking until 9 p.m., so we don't get a ticket uh, for your car before then. Uh, thanks, to, uh, thank you, Jackie, for presenting today. Uh, you uh, you send all your slides? And, uh, uh, yeah, I'll put, them, I'll put them up on SlideShare. Um, if you, uh, your company needs some help and some uh, solutions, call me maybe. Um, <laughs> but this whole, uh, this whole stack is what we kind of specialize in. So. I'll send them out and there's contact information there. Okay. All right, guys, thank you very much for coming and announcing those videos at the holiday party. Thanks for watching.